All right, so today we're gonna to jump into a project analysis, and this is a big one that you guys, of course, have been following the channel for quite some time. You really like a lot of the content built around the metaverse, and today we thought, hey, let's bring in one of the titans of the industry, and that is Sandbox. Joining me today is gonna to be their chief development officer, and that is Matthew Nuzareth, who is uh, gonna be coming in to us, and uh, great to have you on the show, man. Hi, Paul, uh, super happy to be here, excited. All right, so Chief Strategy Officer, what does that do at Sandbox? You guys are building all sorts of things. How does this all play yeah. into it? Yeah, you know, the, the company is still fairly new. We've been uh, about four years old and we have so many things to do and so many things to build. So I'm working with uh, partners, I'm striking deals, you know, and uh, trying to uh, steer the company forward. So are you, Matthew, are you involved in a lot of the initial partnership programs or are you looking at more from a strategic angle internally? Is it more, I guess, outward facing or more from an inward or both? It's more outward facing and I'm looking for new partners and brands and we're also working with, with lots of okay. celebrities, as you may have heard. Oh, absolutely. All right. So give us a rundown on the status of a sandbox today, as far as your, your current state of being, how many people, kind of the whole team. Are you guys more international? Do you have a lot of uh, people here in the U.S.? Kind of give us a, a framework. The, the company is very international. We are a little bit less than 200 people at the moment. Uh, the, the development team is based in, it's split between uh, actually Paris and Buenos Aires in Argentina. But we have a lot of people outside uh, those two countries. Uh, we're also growing very fast here in the U.S. I like it. I like it. When you look at, I'm kind of curious, when you look at the team co construct that you guys are building, whether it's marketing, uh, devs, designers, uh, economy, uh, where do you guys kind of focus on? I mean, are you looking more for the dev side of things of what you see in terms of growth? Or do you think the partnerships are really going to play into this in terms of being able to grow faster? What, what are kind of the weighted areas that you guys are building in? We are really looking at everywhere and uh, we are looking at recruiting hundreds of people this year. This company is a rocket ship. We are growing extremely fast. We have exponential growth, basically. So uh, for us, it's, uh, it's about recruiting as many people as we can. It's engineering, creative people, marketing, business, everything. All right, so let's get into Sandbox uh, as a metaverse. Really, what makes it a true metaverse? Can you kind of explain that to our audience? So the uh, Sandbox is a true metaverse because it is, first of all, it's a very immersive experience. It's a 3D environment and you are free to roam. You can, you know, experience uh, different games. You can go to different lands, to different rooms. You can play mini games. You can meet with people. It is very social. That's for once. And the other thing that which we think makes it a true metaverse is you have a true sense of ownership because the game is based right. uh, on the blockchain. So you really, as a creator, uh, you own what you develop in the game. And that's really, that sets us apart from, from other web to metaverse companies. Yeah, and I like that uh, because when you when you look at different metaverse plays and we've we've been doing analysis of uh, those types of projects along with, you know, the traditional play to earn gaming and also the aspects of digital assets. And I think Sandbox really does a great job on kind of bringing all of that into one place. And especially when you look at the opportunity in terms of brand development and, you know, which is really going to be, I think, the future of where metaverse is going to happen in terms of when we see the next leap forward, a lot of it is going to be based on adoption among other things, but brands and, and partnerships, I think, are going to be playing a big, role, a big role in this. As well as brands and partners, you need a lot of players. You've got season two rolling out. What do you feel is going to be the size of the player population for season two? So season two is opening on March 3rd and is going to last for about 30 days, four weeks, actually, until the end of, okay. of March. And it, it's hard for us to know, you know, uh, how many people to expect. We think hopefully hundreds of thousands of people, maybe more, we'll see. Uh, pretty excited. The team is working around the clock to make sure we are ready uh, and uh, that we can handle the load. Interesting. Hundreds of thousands. I like that. That would be a, a, a great, I think, rollout for season two for sure. All right, let's get into uh, the rewards around season two. Where and what are we going to see out there in season two? 
So we are building about 35 new experiences and an experience for us is really a place where you can go and uh, you can play. Uh, I can't disclose the, the experience. It's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's coming soon. Uh, and we'll have the, the, the game also is really based on the concept of what people call the play to earn experience. So uh, for those people who have who complete um, quests and achieve certain, you know, milestones, we will reward them with our token, the send token. Right. Uh, that is, you know, uh, almost like real money, basically. Yeah. So lots of new experiences we'll see coming into the game. How many, when you look at, because you guys are playing this by seasons right now, so it's a limited time run for each one. How many more seasons will we see before the game becomes playable all the time? Uh, you know, we, we are not exactly sure. We are, you know, still a startup company and we take a very iterative approach. So we'll see what is the result of season two. We definitely will have season three. But beyond that, I think we'll, uh, we'll see. Yeah. I'm looking at it from an aspect of uh, both PC, Mac, and I know you guys had some recent news in, in terms of making the game available. Uh, what are your plans for both, you know, major platforms in terms of PCs of playable uh, applications, including mobile. Where are you guys going to be going with that? So we, you know, long term, we want to support, you know, as many platforms as we can, or at least where the players are. So we started by um, building the game on, on the PC that was for season one, but I'm happy to uh, to report that for season two, the Mac version will be live and, and, and up and running. So that's that's going to open a very big new market for us, especially, you know, in the yeah. US and in, in Western Europe. Yeah. Was there something that you guys were watching in terms of data for mobile and or iOS users that kind of leaned you into that so quickly? Because that's a fairly quick ramp up. A lot of times when you see new apps like this in other ecosystems, they're building on Android. We'll just use mobile apps as an example. They're building on Android Android for sometimes years before they roll out an iOS app. So this is fairly fast for Sandbox. Was there a data set that you were looking at or was just a big demand? There is a big demand. And I think in the US, you know, the, uh, the, the Mac market is pretty big. It's at least, you know, I would say 20, 30, 40% of the overall market. So that was very important for us to address it. Uh, and and um, our code base, you know, allowed us to really uh, launch the Mac version pretty quickly. Yeah. I like it. I, you know, Mac user. Obviously, we we use it here in the studio, and that was one and has been kind of one of the a little bit of the trick uh, of getting into the sandbox game for sure. I also look at uh, set top gaming. If you see the expansion we've seen in traditional gaming, obviously set set tops have been really kind of the focus of that, and it's been a little bit of you know the console wars over the past decade that we've seen more and more movement in that space and a lot of continued advancements in, ter- in terms of technology and all that good stuff. Any plans for Sandbox to move into the console itself? Uh, I can't disclose any plan uh, uh, at the moment, but uh, uh, if we can and if the platform allow us, we'll, long term, we want to support as many platforms as possible. And that's mobile, that's console, that's PC and Mac for now. But uh, uh, yeah. uh, that's the overall plan long term, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be cool. I mean, the fact that you're you're even talking about, it, I mean, at the speed in which we've seen you guys move, especially on the, the iOS side of things, I think that would be a huge step. So good. I'm glad to hear you guys are moving in that direction. Uh, talk about in-browser. Any potential there for real, and I guess the, the overall in-browser experience versus use, using, you know, download applets or things of that nature. Um, and also, when you look at, at mobile gaming, I think mobile gaming, as we see that really ex- accelerate, what would be your roadmap for development in, in that kind of environment? So mobile is definitely on the roadmap. Uh, as for web you know, playing, um, uh, we're not sure yet. I think the, the benefit is obviously that you can play right away, but they also have a lot of uh, technical limitation in our game, you know, is, is uh, uh, relying on the Unity engine. So right now, it's, yeah. it's really on, on uh, an downloadable app. Interesting. So you guys have taken a little bit of a different approach toward the design of the theme of the game, the voxel model, in comparison to some of the other metaverses that are starting to develop, you know, and we won't go into a bunch of those, but talk to me about the Vox Edit and the Game Maker strategy, why going that direction, 
what this can mean is there are some very definitive uh, strategies that are being put in play to make that a much more usable environment in the metaverse. Talk to me about that strategy. So we very early on, we chose to have this style, which is really the voxel or the pixelated, you know, style, if you want. And uh, we're pretty happy about it. And and one of the main reasons behind this choice is that it makes it very, very easy for creators to build experiences. Mm -hmm. And you don't need special coding exp expertise. And you can really build uh, amazing experiences uh, by yourself without being an expert. And I think this is going to make a big difference. Because the, the whole point of, of uh, the sandbox is to really rely on creators, on third-party creators, individuals, companies, um, right. and and we have two tools. The one call is the Vox Edit, which really is made to build assets. The other one is a game maker, which is building the logic. But none of those tools require uh, coding. None of those tools require you know deep you know three D expertise or rendering mm -hmm. or modeling expertise. So it's really opening up a very big market for creators. Yeah. What do you think is going to draw in the really creative houses, media companies, you know, brands, all those companies that really could utilize this as a tool? What, what would be some of the incentives that would really bring them into the space to create their own care, whether it's uh, playable NFTs or, you know, brand experiences, all those kind of things? What are some of the, the key points they'll, that will draw them in? So the, the first key point is is that uh, the sandbox right now is having uh, you know uh, an amazing traction and this is where people are going. So that's really mm -hmm. at the end of the day, this is why brands and, and partners will come to the sandbox. Um, and and another reason is that yeah the, the the development environment is is very easy to use and they're free to do what they want. So they can build new types of experiences. They can experiment. They can attract users. They can go from you know. Uh, uh, engaging the audience. Eventually, they will also do uh, uh, online shopping. So the, the, the possibilities are unlimited. Yeah. Any plan to uh, make Game Maker available in terms of the design metric to go maybe into some other styles other than the model that you guys have created now? Is there any potential expansion of that? Uh, not at this time. We're pretty happy with our style and uh, uh, makes it super easy for everyone to um, um, you know, enter. So we've been playing with uh, our own uh, creation here, here in our studio. Uh, kind of curious, when will creators be able to build and actually launch their, their playable NFTs on the, on the platform? So if you are a creator, the, uh, the Game Maker and the Vox Edit um, software is available right now. You don't have to mm -hmm. wait the opening or the season, you can experiment, you can build NFTs, you can build, you know, games, you can terraform a piece of land and terraforming by that, I mean, you know, building right. uh, the, the land and the buildings and the cars and everything. It's, it's already available today. But to be able to use it though with, I mean, actually launch it would be the next step. Right now you're doing it with just yes. certain creators. What are some of the criteria, I guess, and qualifications that those creators have to meet to be able to launch a playable NFT? So right now we're working with big brands and and uh, and big partners, and you may have seen our announcements. We're working with Ubisoft, we're working right. with Gucci, we're working with Warner Music, and a bunch of others that are going to be announced soon. But uh, ultimately, you know, the 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 game and the platform is going to open to everybody. We at, at heart we're a decentralized platform. And uh, um, everyone will be able to do whatever they want on, the, on their land. Yeah. That gets me into partnerships because we, we see that as a big strategy. Obviously, you as the lead in this area. One of the strategies that we continue to see in the metaverse side of things, and I think this is a real critical point right now, we are at a very early adoption phase, way before we're going to see the bell, bell curve occur in, in terms of even just beginning to crack the surface on major adoption. Partnerships will play a big role in that. I'm kind of curious when you look at that adoption, you know, lin kind of on a linear standpoint of say early brands who come into the space, they they get involved in a project or something, but maybe their projects aren't moving as as much, or we're not seeing as ma uh, an, enough mass adoption. Do you think these brands will see any sort of fatigue in being able to come into a metaverse and say, you know, I'm there, but you know, we haven't really seen adoption? really occur yet. Have you started to see any of that? 
No, we haven't seen that at the moment. You know, the, the traffic is really growing very, very fast. We have a lot of people interested in joining the sandbox. We haven't seen that. And, and uh, you know, we are very, very early on. We, you know, eventually we hope to have millions and tens of millions of players. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, I think it will play very much in favor of, of the brand's ex- experience in, in, in the sandbox. A lot of major you know, partnerships, obviously with Snoop, you've got some stuff with Ubisoft. Any plans to move into areas like Disney, you know, Nintendo? I mean, there's just so many opportunities here, I think, for Sandbox. What are the big achievement areas that you're looking at in terms of par- partnerships? So we're looking at games, and I can't comment on, on, on any unannounced partners, but uh, gaming is obviously a very big uh, vertical for us. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is, is they don't, I mean, right now they have to work with us, but ultimately, you know, anyone can come on, on the sandbox and mm-hmm. build the experience they want. So they don't need, don't need our blessing or they don't need to ask for permission. They just can buy a piece of land and, uh, uh, and okay. build something. So gaming, uh, we will do, you know, uh, retail, online shopping, social experiences, we think the sandbox is is more than a game. It's it's a full fledged you know metaverse that's gonna uh, uh, have so many different experiences. Uh, Matthew, when you look at events, because this is one of the things we've seen kind of happen over the past couple of years. Virtual events have really become a big thing. We're seeing and kind of accustomed to you know being in the metaverse as it is today with just so many different virtual types of social experiences that we're having, whether it's work, you know, school, you name it, it's really kind of changed. When you look at events, how would that be different than maybe what we've seen kind of flowing into what what the, I, I would say Web 2 has really been about so far? Any big differences in terms of how events will roll out in Sandbox? So the events, are, you know, are um, will be a place where you know people can gather and they can socialize and they can, for example, attend a concert. We have announced a concert with Snoop Dogg that's coming soon, right. uh, and uh, I think the experience is going to be way more immersive than a Web two companies. And also, what what's going to make it very different is you can really uh, own what you bring with you. So you have uh, a Snoop Dogg avatar if you have a wearable, or if you have uh, uh, little sneakers, for example, that are you know showing on on your avatar, and to the people around you, you really own this, and uh, that's uh, we think you know it's it's a way for people to s- express themselves and show who they are to their community. Yeah, I think with with events, we'll see a lot of creativity because that's one thing that we are starting to see already. You know, just in how virtual events are being done, we've seen, especially in the play to earn space. I think we'll see a lot more in that area. Do you think from an event standpoint, whether it's entertainment, gaming, maybe even something in the in the line of esports, where do you see, I guess, the biggest opportunity for events in the future? So very short term, we think, you know, uh, concerts are uh, very promising uh, and uh, there is a big demand to attend concert with virtual, you know, celebrities yeah. and, and uh, yeah, look forward to our uh, next one with uh, the first one with Snoop Dogg coming soon. So concerts kind of playing in, uh, at least right now, in, in the early stages, uh, but advancing beyond that is still kind of up in, up in the air for new ideas yeah. and, and opportunities. I think, you know, we're, we're pretty excited to see what the landowners and the creators will mm-hmm. make. And, and we are right. more a platform and we can't wait for them to show us what they have in mind. I think this is the beauty of the model. We rely on them to show us the way forward. Yeah, very cool. We've, you know, have you seen, I guess there's a lot of different strategies that are being built around the companies that are actually building within the sandbox now, because there's opportunities there, I think, as you start to see more and more of that. You know, we've seen a uh, big movement with ad shares here recently on, on their advancements of being able to possibly segue real world advertising into metaverses in the future. What are your thoughts on that? How do you think that's going to roll into the future of how metaverses will populate from, you know, a monetization standpoint? So monetization today is driven by the uh, the whole ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem. 
Uh, and, uh, and I think this is also how it's different from Web2 companies. Web2 companies usually start by trying to build a massive audience and then they monetize it through advertising, sometimes subscriptions or sometimes microtransaction or in-app purchase, for example. Web3 companies take a different approach and we take a different approach today where actually monetization is, is present from day one. And this is actually what's driving, you know, uh, user adoption. That being said, I think we'll, you know, we're open to other ways of monetization in the future. Uh, it's very likely that there will be advertising. What format? We don't know. Maybe it's just, you know, billboards being displayed in the game. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, we'll, we, you know, we'll see what, you know, creators will, will do with it. You know, it, it's going to be up to them to come up with their own solution, creative solutions. Yeah. When you look at adoption, because with, with, Partnerships like that, obviously with events, a lot of the, the things that we're starting to see within the sandbox, the roll up to mass adoption, Matthew, when you when you kind of look at this on a on a roadmap, and obviously you guys have to be prepared from a development standpoint, you know, also from a brand partnership standpoint as you continue to grow, where do you think that, you know, kind of that tipping point occurs? Do you think it's a 2022? Time frame? Do you think this is more in the 2023 time frame for a lot of these types of metaverse plays to really run out? Uh, I think it's really hard to say. Uh, we send the sandbox is one of the very few metaverse that's already you know uh, up and running that's live uh, because we started so early in 2018. Right. So this is when the development started. So uh, uh, as far as we're concerned, you know we already see you know uh, adoption right now. For other metaverse, maybe it's a 2023, 2024 event, depending on, on when they launch. Uh, and, and building a metaverse like the Sandbox is a very, very difficult endeavor. I mean, technically and creatively, and you need a lot of engineers and creative people mm -hmm. and designers and project managers. It's really building. It's not something that can happen overnight. So it's going to take a long time for, uh, for other metaverse, I think. Let, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I, you know, I think Sandbox has been, you know, kind of the clear leader in the space in terms of not only functionality, the option with season one and what we're seeing now coming with season two, the ability to really ramp up and take on new players and, and scale that is going to be critical. And I think as you guys start to roll into more seasons, we'll, we'll see that, you know, from a media standpoint and a, an analysis standpoint, what we're watching, you know, is how these projects perform under stress and under congestion, you know, so to speak. So that'll be a good one to kind of uh, kind of look at. Let's go into the tokenomics to a, a certain extent. Talk to me about, you know, because many platforms out there, whether it's games, they usually have a, a governance token or there's some alternative token to the primary uh, token model that many of these projects will deploy. You guys only have one token. Is there, explain, I guess, that model, why you feel like that is the place and the strategy to take? So we felt that having one token makes things way more simple. Uh, and we have the Send token that's listed on many, many exchanges today. And, uh, you know, I think we're going we're gonna to keep it that way for now. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, staking rewards. Um, this is fantastic you know we we continue to see more and more opportunities for, especially for sand is this something that's going to be around for a while or do you think this is going to have a, a little bit of a limited life yeah no no this is something that's going to stay you know stay around and we have right now a fantastic apy meaning you know the, the financial yep. rewards you can make by by taking mm -hmm. your sand so you know uh uh we're super happy with the the, the initial response of investors and it's something that's very important for the ecosystem. The ecosystem of you know sandbox is built around the play to earn um, economy, but also on on investors and staking and you know uh, betting long term on on our on our token. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm thinking we are going to see some mass adoption occurring in the metaverse, especially when we start to see key partnerships, personalities, uh, entertainers maybe events, somebody that the, the first time that people get a, tan, a chance to attend, whether it's virtual events, a concert, different kinds of entertainment aspects, we'll probably see a fairly significant uptick along with what we could see in traditional cryptocurrency markets uh, in terms of major financial institutions being able to come into the space, whether it's through regulation or just, you know, it, inertia of adoption. With all of that happening and you look at onboarding, being able to really kind of ramp 
up and scale uh, in the sandbox. Talk to me about the strategy there, because right now it is still a process of you've got to go through a MetaMask approach. You know, there are some, some steps you have to take to be able to get into the game. Any potential for fiat onboarding or other methods that would enable, you know, larger, uh, less, I won't call them, just less experienced, you know, people that aren't really um, crypto native, so to speak, uh, in the future? Um, I, I can't comment about fiat, but uh, uh, what you say is, is true. And, and we know, you know, we're working very, very hard to make the onboarding experience much more user friendly and easier to use. And I think it's it's a you know uh, it's a general trend not just for the sandbox but for all cryptocurrency platforms. Right. And uh, we initially tapped into the uh, you know the, uh, uh, the the enthusiast crypto users, and and as time goes by, we we are aware that we we need to onboard more regular users, and we're working you know around the clock to make sure that the, the experience is smooth and easy to use. Yeah. Any plan to do any additional DeFi uh, integrations, whether it's, you know, additional DeFi wallets, any other potentials for being able to integrate right now? Uh, right now, we, you know, we, we, we're happy with what we have on, on staking, you know, the SEND and you can, you know, stake SEND with, with Matic, for example, the, the other right. currency, the, the other pair. And uh, I think we'll, we'll see, we'll learn from that and we'll take it from there. We, you know, we have a very iterative approach. And we first we want to learn what's happening uh, with our current DeFi uh, uh, product. Yeah, moving to layer two on Polygon, is this something that you feel like is end game for uh, Sandbox, or are there? Do you feel like this is going to be cross chain? Really start to look at much more expansive approaches. What what is the strategy there? I think we right now we're very much focusing on moving to Polygon, and the you know the two reasons we move to Polygon is a the fees are going to be way, way cheaper when we right. finalize the uh, the transition. And B, also, it's it's much better for the environment. It uses, like, almost no energy to uh, uh, to be on the Polygon network. So really, uh, 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 you know, we're super excited, and we can't wait to launch uh, on Polygon soon. I was looking at, just in general, when you think about uh, Ubisoft, Square Enix, Atari, all are join, joining in the sandbox right now. And you see traditional gaming studios, and, and this is a, a big question we've had with, with many experts in the space of, will we see two emergences of industries uh, really start to t continue to take place right now? Because right now, blockchain gaming, blockchain um, metaverse uh, environments are kind of building their own, you know, I won't call it a silo, but they're definitely not necessarily connected to traditional studios today. Do you see there will be at any point in the future potential convergence of those of those two marketplaces in the future, whether it's metaverse, play to earn gaming, or maybe a combination of both? I think a lot of very big traditional game publishers are looking at you know uh, uh, building crypto game crypto games and also you know in looking into uh, making games for the sandbox and others. So I think over time I see these those two markets converging and and being just one. Uh, like, you know, you just, you know, or, uh, you don't call online gaming. It's, I mean, it's just gaming today. Most of the right. games are yeah. online and, and we think, you know, crypto gaming is going to, you know, merge into being just, just gaming. Gaming. Yeah. That's something that, uh, we've had that conversation with a lot of, of gaming guilds that, uh, work with us and just understanding some of the emerging games that are being developed. And, and they kind of talk to that point is that. You know, today it's it's very early, so it, you know there are some ways to kind of understand the differentiator. But in the future, we, we'll start to see such a mesh between the two, you know, potential worlds that it won't be necessarily even discerned as as separate categories in the future. So that's going to be interesting. When you look, okay, so strategy wise, there's a lot of plays being made in the space right now. You've got Microsoft, obviously Sony making acquisitions. What are your thoughts about these kinds of acquisitions? Because there are some strategic plays within this, both from a gaming standpoint, but maybe from uh, a blockchain gaming and a metaverse standpoint that could play out in the future. What are your thoughts on how those kind of the bigger uh, players are starting to uh, kind of knock on the door? I think the, the bigger players today are moving more into 
what I would call the, the metaverse from a point of view of building immersive experiences. Mm -hmm. And we have yet to see those big players, you know, moving into the blockchain. And, and I think it's going to be a bit harder for them long term or even, let's say, mid term. As yeah. the, uh, this is a new business model. This is a new ecosystem to build that sometimes is really at odds with their, their DNA and their culture. So uh, I think it's it's going to take a while for, for those big guys to really adopt a, a full blockchain gaming approach. Do you see that happening also? I mean, I know you guys did a, a, you know, a partnership with Warner Music, but do you see that happening also in other sectors such as entertainment? Because this is something, let's just take music for a second, you know, outside of film and, you know, other aspects of, obviously you're doing stuff with entertainers already, but if you think about studios and traditional aspects, especially around content creation, the opportunities there are going to be pretty big. Do you think that is going to be the case with uh, the entertainment side of things as well? Slow adoption and we'll see new creations kind of being created within these metaverse environments? Or do you think they'll be emerged yes. at, at some point? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, entertainment companies and especially music companies wants to, uh, they, they want to, you know, uh, enter the metaverse and they're working with us. And uh, actually, music is, is a very promising uh, uh, niche for us. Not a niche, actually. It's, it's a very big market, but it's a very good vertical. And uh, they are, right now, they are experimenting. They see what they can do. And we think music is going to be you know, leading the, uh, the entertainment world in, into the, the metaverse and the blockchain space. Uh, you have yeah. so many projects um, that are really uh, get a lot of traction at the moment. Well, if you think about it too, Matthew, I mean, if you look back at the evolution of, of just music in general, what we saw all the way back in the days of Napster and the evolution of what the MP3 did to the music industry, it's, it, music seems to be the vibe that does connect new generations, especially around new technology, because that was really when the shift did occur that, to where we are today, which is mostly streaming. And eventually we'll see that in some form in terms of blockchain. I think truly we'll see entertainment, music, creators, artists, all making this shift into both the NFT tokenization of their content, moving that direction. So I, I would agree with you there in terms of what, what the potentials are for sure. All right, so lots, lots happening in the space around this. Uh, obviously Facebook, hence Meta, they're making a big play. They're having some challenges right now. They're getting a chance to really see the development load that it takes to be able to build something of this scale and in this magnitude, obviously them being you know, at already a heavy magnitude right now. What do you think their future is uh, being able to make that leap into the metaverse? You know what? Nobody knows. I think we are, uh, you know, we, I think we just have to wait and see. I think it may take a few years. Um, um, and we'll see what what they come up with, and you know, uh, we will come we'll, we'll come into the the metaverse world. Yeah, well, that statement right there, nobody knows. Is the it, that one is to me probably the biggest because that's you're exactly right. So many people we've asked this question to, and it's kind of an unknown. And if you look back at the history of Facebook's acquisitions and Meta's acquisitions, in many of the cases, they did know where it was going, whether you looked at where and what the future was for Instagram. And I think the fact that we are seeing kind of an unknown element right now probably is one of the biggest challenges out there already. Just for you to say that about, you know, what is close to a trillion dollar valuation, it's pretty interesting to see how that market's going to go. Last question I have for you. All right, lots of new uh, startups kind of really rolling in the space. You guys obviously connected with Animoca Brands. What do you think in terms of importance that brings to the table, especially in being able to acquire and attract new partnerships? Do you feel like new games and or new metaverses or new environments within the blockchain really need to pair up with the right kinds of investment houses and strategic companies to be able to excel? Or do you think you know, are we still in an industry where the, the, you know, kind of the David Goliath potential could still happen out there in the market? I think you will see a little bit of both. You will see big companies or big, you know, uh, big startup companies with a lot of financing entering the space and creating amazing products. But I think you'll see also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very, very small, tiny, small team right. companies coming up with amazing uh, experiences that you know no one thought about before, and and mm -hmm. uh, very much like in the the beginning of the web two or even web web companies, you could have like 
you know, companies with two or three founders coming up with amazing product that eventually became the big, you know, the big uh, tech company that we know of today. So I think it's yeah. going to be a little bit of both. I have to show you a creation we did uh, here in our own studio uh, for a second. And we're trying to get this one into, <laughs> into Sandbox. We call, we call this one Metapol. <laughs> Metapol, very cute. I think you'll I like do it. well. Sell this as an NFT. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get it in there. We definitely want to participate. We can't wait to, to have some fun in the Sandbox. It's going to be kind of interesting. we got some events coming. we got some cool stuff happening here within our own media company. So we're, we're looking at, at opportunities uh, around that. Hey, it's been great having you on the show, Matthew. Thank you so much for uh, stopping in today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. That, of course, is a great place to listen in, but the one place to come is over here on YouTube because that's where all the content is done from an aspect of analysis, but we also drop a lot of our charts. Plus, we do these great interviews like this. And of course, all you have to do is just search Paul Barron Network. You'll find us on YouTube. Make sure and like and subscribe to a couple of videos and make sure and leave some comments below if you're watching this uh, later and want to have more content like this, or maybe you've got a target that you think we should be interviewing. Make sure and let us know. And of course, if you want to do that out on social media, you can do that on Twitter, just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath. Bath.